Hungary goes to the polls this weekend with the campaign being closely watched here in Brussels in what looks to be a highly contested race. Hello and welcome to our election debate from the European Parliament in the Belgian capital, the beating heart of the EU. I'm Sandor Giros from Euronews. And I'm Caroline Will from Debating Europe. Despite Hungary's medium size, there is a lot of attention on the country's controversial Prime Minister Viktor Orban. The question is, can he retain power or will the united opposition seize control? The aim of this debate is to look at the impact of the Hungarian elections and its politics on the whole of Europe. We will be joined by MEPs from across the political spectrum, as well as one Hungarian expert on what the biggest issues are for voters. And we will have data and questions from the Debating Europe community. But before we start the debate, let's take a look at a short video explaining what's going on with the Hungarian elections. Hungary decides. And the question is, will Prime Minister Viktor Orban stay in power? Or will opposition leader Petr Markizoy come out victorious? Viktor Orban's Conservative government has led the country for 12 years now, holding an absolute majority of seats since 2010. In this time, the long-serving Prime Minister radically overhauled the legal system, transforming its institutions and all while prompting a bitter fight with the EU over the rule of law and migration. Me, it, the right wing. We are not biased losers who get scared by the influential international media. Brussels bureaucrats and the rich George Soros standing behind the left. And we are sending a message to them that we are ready to fight. Orban's opponents accuse him of eroding the country's democratic institutions, inciting hatred and straining relations with Brussels. Now, six opposition parties are banding together to challenge Orban's grip on power. And leading this ragtag coalition is Hungary's right-wing conservative mayor, Petr Markizoy. Exit polls do not make me sad. I am one of the misguided politicians who never won a single exit poll. But also, I've never lost a single election. Hungary's parliamentary democracy elects MPs after one round of voting who then choose the Prime Minister. But like many countries around the world, Hungarian society is deeply divided on a whole host of issues, something this election will be hoping to settle. As we just heard, Viktor Orban's government has changed the political landscape of Hungary significantly, prompting a huge debate on Europe as well. Joining us to discuss all of this is Tina Kestrek from the Netherlands. She's a Green MEP. Michal Simecka, Slovak MEP from the Renew Europe Group. And Gerolf Anemann, a Belgian MEP from the Identity and Democracy Group. Welcome to you. Welcome all of you. First of all, I would like to go to Tineke. You have visited Hungary a couple of weeks ago on a fact-finding mission. What was your impression? Why is the Hungarian politics important on European level? Well, my, my, my main impression was what everyone told me also, that the EU has led Orban to uh, gradually uh, uh, undermine the rule of law system. So because of that this has taken place for 12 years now, uh, this, this, this rule of law undermining has really already been cemented in the whole structure, meaning that there are no independent institutions anymore, that there's no media freedom anymore, that NGOs cannot work freely, and that minorities such as LGBTI people are really suffering from uh, a lack of freedom in the way they want to live. Uh, so uh, they are coming from a, a long way already, and uh, Orban has used that space. And I, I think it also showed to me that the EU has not been successful so far to protect the EU values and, uh, uh, and the fundamental rights of the people in Hungary. Herolf, are your voters in Flanders also concerned about the Hungarian democracy or not? Well, let me first say I'm not here representing the Hungarian government or uh, Mr. Orban. Um, by the way, I think it's quite deplorable that we have a debate here in the center of the European Union without any Hungarian 
uh, around the table. But afar apart from that, we signed a common agreement with Mr. Orban uh, last year in July as a group, as an ID group and, and, and together with the ECR group. Uh, to have some common views on the way the European Union should evolve in the future. And I think uh, that uh, we have our differences, and every member state has its differences on the way the social engineering uh, uh, and the, the liberty, the freedom to uh, design your own society uh, should prevail. But uh, that doesn't prevent us from criticizing the European Union that itself wants a social engineering also. And so uh, the Flemish are not voting for Mr. Orban, the Flemish are voting for Flamsbelang, but we together here in this uh, hemicycle, we try to uh, make the European Union evolve in the right direction, which is not the case now. Mika, from the neighboring uh, Slovakia, I guess people are watching closely the elections of Hungary. What is at stake? Well, at stake is uh, democracy in Hungary. Uh, at stake is um, you know, politics, democratic politics in, in Central Europe, uh, the Visegrad group. But I think what's at stake is also the European Union's ability to, to continue to be a club of liberal democracies. This is uh, one of the most consequential elections uh, we'll have, perhaps the most consequential uh, elections in the EU. And this is precisely uh, because uh, Viktor Orban has been consistently undermining um, the rule of law, freedom of the media, fundamental rights. And this is a concern for the entire European Union, because if the EU, as it's unfortunately been the case, is unable to protect the rights uh, of, of its citizens, of Hungarian citizens, uh, this could pose an existential question, an existential crisis for, for the EU um, down the road. So it's, uh, so it's huge, not just for Slovakia, but, but for all of us, uh, uh, not least because of uh, the kind of money that the European Union has been pouring into into Hungary via, you know, cohesion funds, structural funds. Mm. And Viktor Orban has used this, used this money to cement his power. And I think that's something that's no longer acceptable to, to taxpayers across the European Union, including in Slovakia. So Viktor Orban is often attacking uh, Brussels. Let's go to Caroline, who will show us an interesting graph about how Hungarians see the European Union. Caroline. Thank you, Sandor. Uh, I've got some figures from a recent Eurobarometer poll that may be surprising to some. People from across the European Union were asked if they believed that their country had, on balance, benefited from being a member of the EU. As you can see here, 79% of Hungarians believe that their country has all in all benefited from being in the EU, and only 19% said that EU membership was, on, ba on balance, not beneficial for, the, for Hungary. That's actually a comparatively high approval rate, especially when you take into account that across all 27 EU countries, only 72% of respondents thought that their country had benefited from EU membership, with 23% saying that it had not. So, as you can see, despite Viktor Orban's clashes with Brussels, most Hungarians are happy to be a part of the EU. Back to you, Sandor. Now let's cross to Budapest, where we have our expert, András Bíronagy. He is an expert in Hungarian politician, politics and also uh, head of the Policy Solutions Research Institute. András, welcome. So we can see from this data that Hungarians are really support EU membership. On the other hand, they have a Eurosceptical government. How do you explain that? <clears throat> the Fidesz government can get away with Eurosceptic rhetorics because of the fact that uh, uh, these numbers that have been shown uh, don't show the full picture. Because it's true, of course, that uh, uh, the general attitudes towards the European Union membership are positive. But if the question is uh, whether the European Union works well or how the European Union's future should look like, then the country and the Hungarian voters are much more divided. So if the question is whether there should be more Europe or whether there should be more sovereignty in the future, then the Hungarian society is roughly evenly divided. So as long as the Hungarian government is not flirting with the idea of Huxit, of Hungary leaving the European Union, but uh, trying to criticize the European Union's functioning from within, then it can still meet some support from their own voters. And how deep are the divisions between uh, pro-government and uh, opposition voters and uh, what are the main issues in the campaign? Hungarian society is actually one of the most polarized societies in, 
Europe. So it's unimaginable at this point that, uh, for example, an Orban voter would uh, now switch sides and vote for the opposition uh, at the uh, elections. Now, the key question is uh, what the undecided voters will do in the final days of the campaign, whether they can be urged from uh, the opposition or from the government to uh, join their ranks. A crucial issue in this campaign now is the war, of course, and there are two competing narratives. Uh, the opposition is campaigning on East versus West, where Hungary should belong, because if this is the question of the campaign, then of course the opposition is in a winning uh, position. But Viktor Orban tries to reframe the whole war issue uh, around uh, the peace and security narrative that he has uh, been uh, using for a couple of weeks and tries to uh, put the opposition into the position of uh, uh, are responsible players who would bring Hungary into war. And the main question is uh, what Hungarian voters uh, will uh, consider a more credible narrative. Michal, I would like to ask you from a Slovak point of view, there is many criticism against uh, Prime Minister Orban that he was actually too close to Vladimir Putin in the past. Do you agree with this or he just did the business as usual? Well, it's not just some criticism. I mean, uh, he visited Moscow and had this meeting with, with Mr. Putin just days before the invasion. Um, obviously, Russia has invested heavily in... in um, in the nuclear uh, energy sector in Hungary. There's lots of other deals which unfortunately mostly benefit um, you know, oligarchs and friends of Fidesz. So there's this long-standing relationship. I, I even remember that at some point um, Viktor Orban uh, called Putin's Russia role model um, a, a few years back. So yes, of course, there's this closeness and, uh, and, and it's now a problem for the, for the entire European Union. So far, Viktor Orban has, um, uh, has supported or tacitly, reluctantly supported uh, the sanctions, but he's already um, already saying that he will veto further sanctions. He has not uh, um, he has not supported any military assistance or any provision of equipment to uh, to for, for Ukraine to defend itself. And he has even been reluctant to to call uh, you know Russia's president for uh, you know call out the aggression that it is. So uh, if he wins, if Viktor Orban wins, it could be uh, that it could throw into jeopardy or the EU and, and NATO's policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia and Ukraine uh, going, uh, go, going further. If there is a need for, for new sanctions, perhaps, you can expect, uh, if, uh, if Viktor Orban wins, that he will, uh, he will try to block that. So this is crucial also for, for the security of Europe and, and of course, for, for, for the region of Central, Central Eastern Europe. Kerolf, I would like to ask you, you mentioned uh, there were some talks for cooperation uh, together with Hungary's uh, governing party, Fidesz. Do you see a current foreign political situation posing a risk for this? Well, I don't think um, we should mix up things. I hope that the Hungarians have the freedom to choose their own government. Uh, at least that should be the case. Uh, in this European Union itself is divided into two parts. The federalist part that, will, that want to go further in the, in the federali federalizing the European Union, uh, uh, which, was sta which started as a civil cooperation model, a platform, uh, it's now becoming a state, a centralized state, like in the German governmental agreement is mentioned, a federal state called Europe. Now, either we go in that direction or we keep member states uh, as, 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 as platforms of local democracy and confidence. And so if I see that someone gets a, 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 an absolute majority during 12 years, that is unique. The same we see in Poland, and it's not a, a, a hazard in my view that the European Federalists, namely the majority in this European Parliament, attacks these two countries, especially the two countries that liberated themselves from the Soviet Union for the first uh, as, as, as first uh, countries that did that. So instead of um, being reluctant and uh, looking how this uh, local democracy evolves, uh, the European Union attacks them, them both. And it's a scandal in my view. Uh, I think the, 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 the future European cooperation should start from the member states and the freedom of development of their own societies and cooperation here, okay, but in freedom and not in the European federal state that we see now.
Tineke, would you like maybe to react on this statement that the EU is attacking Hungary and Brussels, yes, Hungary and look, Poland? Of course, citizens uh, should be free to vote for uh, their party or their politician of their own political preference. Th th that is not the issue. This is actually what the EU tries to, uh, to, to defend also in, in all our member states. But the point is that even if a party is elected, even with a, has the majority in parliament, that doesn't give a carte blanche for this government to uh, abolish the rights of the citizens, to abolish democracy and to monopolize its, 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 its power uh, regarding media, judiciary, etc., etc., because this is a, a, a very important issue of the EU. It's, it's not a, just a civil permissive project or whatever. There's a very clear commitment and legal obligation in the treaties that every member state should defend and uh, secure democracy, uh, independence, uh, judiciary, uh, uh, freedom of media, fundamental rights of every citizen. So that's so important of a, of a democracy that also minorities who are not uh, 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 the, the, the supporters of a government are also protected in their rights. And it's just a matter of, this is actually the essence of the EU, I would say, and not something, you know, created uh, uh, very recently, because we need to have this mutual trust between the member states that we know that an, a judge is independent, for instance, so that you can really closely uh, cooperate. And this is not the case anymore. So we are here, also the EU, to protect individual citizens, but also protect the EU EU cooperation uh, between uh, the member states and what Misha also said to protect the EU money because if uh, you know there's a lot at stake uh, if it comes to to funding also Orban is very much interested in, in keeping the money uh, flowing to uh, Hungary but if there is a risk of corruption and we don't have an independent corruption, anti-corruption body. And this is the case, actually. We have a lot of evidence that corruption and bribery is taking place. Then, uh, and, and judgments are not being implemented. You know, Orban doesn't care about judgments. Then we should make sure that the money uh, cannot simply unconditionally be uh, granted to such governments. So there's a lot at stake. So there is a new mechanism on that. We will talk about yep. that. But before that, we will go to Caroline. Caroline, what have you got for us? Thank you. So we reached out to our Debating Europe community and encouraged them to send us their questions on the Hungarian elections. So what are young Europeans concerned about? Let's hear from Marta from Italy. Is it possible to reverse the long-lasting impact of the rule of law crisis, especially with regard of Hungary's neighbours? And moreover, what would be the change in its relations within the European Union? Michael, do you think can this uh, process be reversed? Of course it can be reversed. Um, a lot depends on the election outcome. Uh, a lot depends on, on the Hungarian citizens themselves, of course. That's, uh, that's ultimately their choice to make. But um, uh, here in the European Parliament, in the European Commission, in the European Council, uh, there's a lot that the EU could and, and should have done, frankly, a long time ago, to help protect the sort of the basic, the fundamental values uh, and principles upon which the European Union is built. And we have gone some way over the past years, partly because uh, of what's happening in, in Hungary, to some extent Poland. We now have uh, this particular conditionality mechanism uh, that allows, that's now um, a legal instrument that we have that's, uh, that allows basically the European Commission and then the, the, then the Council to suspend payments uh, to a particular member state or government which systematically violates the rule of law. We have the famous Article 7, uh, we have monitoring tools. Uh, so, so now I think the European Union is well equipped to uh, to both protect its core values and also, also to, uh, to, to support free media, uh, you know, the development of independent journalism, civil society. Uh, the problem, as it often is, that the member states are reluctant to use even those tools um, that we have. And, and we have been reluctant for you know, over 10 years to act. Uh, and this is, this is where it got us. And now we have, uh, now we have Viktor Orban where he is. But just, just one final thing 
if I could, to, to react to the previous discussion, I think there's lots of um, you know, arguments being made that uh, you know, Hungary and Poland are being punished or being attacked because they are conservative or because they have a particular exactly. you know, ideology, which is, which is not the case at all. And, and the, uh, for instance, the condition, conditionality regulation makes it pretty clear that uh, any suspension of, of, uh, of Euro, uh, European money is because uh, of transgressions over the rule of law, independence of judiciary, not because the government is socialist or Hold liberal on, or anything Gerard else. would like to react probably on the rule of law conditionality or you have the floor. Well, floor. Uh, thank you. Uh, we think that the rule of law concept basically is a good thing, of course, but that it, that it has been ex extended and expanded in the last few years as a political tool of a left-wing majority in the European Parliament, a federalist, left-wing, uh, liberal uh, majority in this Parliament, has decided to take this rule of law mechanism against, indeed, as you explain, uh, patriots, conservative nations that vote in, a, in an absolute majority for a government that follows the program that it promises. And so these two states are uh, against the social designing, the social engineering that this left-wing majority in this parliament has in mind for this federal European state. They want to unify the territory of the whole continent and they want to impose a social model. And this social model is so-called uh, imposed to member states by the rule of law mechanism, including uh, financial sanctions, etc. Whereas these countries have the right to this money or not. And it's not depending to, uh, of this, in, in our mind, it's not depending on the discussion of how the rule of law should be implied in member states. I can see that Tina Ke wants to react. Yeah, well, <clears throat> look, um, the EU is not a cafeteria or something that you can say, OK, I want the money but I don't want the obligation that come along with being a member of the EU. That, that cannot be true. And if there is um, or abuse of money, or we know that citizens uh, are under pressure, are suppressed, then uh, there should be no right of granting uh, uh, this, this money. So it has to come along together. Your question was about irreversibility of the changes that have been made. Uh, there have been a lot of unconstitutional legislative changes being made during the last 12 years. So I think what is very important, even if the opposition will win, that the EU will support them and invest a lot in making sure that uh, we will come back to the, to the restoration of the rule of law, independent media, etc., etc., and so that people can start living in, in a free modus. And, and that would also require that all those institutions that are necessary for the checks and balances within society, that we also look at the way that they have been appointed. Because there's a lot of political uh, appointments being made, people completely loyal to uh, Orban. So that's also needing our attention to make sure that they can become independent again. Now let's cross to Budapest uh, to Andres. Andres, can you tell us please how far are these uh, topics related to the state of the democracy and uh, to the rule of law are represented in the campaign? Are people in Hungary, opposition or pro-government voters concerned about this issue? Several of our researches over the last few years have shown that uh, unfortunately for the Hungarian public, uh, issues related to democracy and the rule of law are not really priorities. Actually, currently, according to our most uh, latest uh, research, the top issues for Hungarians are the uh, increasing cost of living, low salaries, the state of health care, and low pensions. So you can really see that uh, uh, Hungarians are really, really concerned about uh, their economic situation, and this is why uh, Viktor Orban has decided to make some extraordinary spending measures during this campaign in order to at least postpone uh, these problems uh, after the elections. So Orban's goal is currently to just survive until the elections, um, uh, if, if it's possible, and uh, whatever comes uh, after that, uh, he will be happy to do whatever it takes, but, uh, but the important thing is that on the 3rd of April he has to win. We already mentioned uh, corruption and the use or misuse of EU funds. Let's go now to Caroline again, who has some interesting data for us. 
Thank you, Shandor. Here we have data from Transparency International's index uh, on the perceived corruption in, within Hungary's public sector. It measures factors such as bribery or the misuse of public funds for personal interests, as well as existing laws and measures against corruption to determine a country's score of public sector corruption. This score is on a scale of 0 to 100, where 0 means highly corrupt and 100 means very clean. At the beginning of this graph in 2012, Hungary still scored 55 points on the scale, but as you can see, it has steadily declined ever since. Last year, in 2021, Hungary achieved only 43 out of a possible 100 points. To put this into perspective, the average score in the European Union is 64, and Hungary is in fact the country with the second lowest score in the entire EU, with only Bulgaria ranking even lower. The data is clear. Unfortunately, there seems to be a, a, a high level of corruption in Hungary's public sector. And this is a particularly worrying trend because, as Transparency International notes, corruption goes hand in hand with human rights abuses and the erosion of democracy. Back to you, Shandor. Andras, I would like to go back to you, to Budapest. How far are uh, opposition and pro-government voters are concerned with uh, corruption issues? On corruption, <clears throat> the ma major thing is that for the opposition voters, it's highly important. It's one of the top issues for them. So it's certainly a key a topic with which uh, the opposition can mobilize their voters. And it's also important for undecided voters. But what uh, limits the effect of corruption scandals is that apparently Fidesz voters will not leave Viktor Orban or the Fidesz party just because of the corruption issues. They believe that other uh, policies of the government, just like uh, conservative family policies or the utility price cost freeze uh, or defending the national interest are way Im more important for them than, uh, than the fact that uh, uh, in Hungary corruption is, is really rising uh, over the last few years. So it seems that for the opposition it could work, but uh, nobody should expect that corruption scandals themselves, in, in themselves, would just uh, result in a change in government in Hungary. Much more is needed to that. Tineke, how do Dutch people see the use of European funds in Hungary? Well, they are very critical to it. And they indeed, uh, not all, but many, uh, also make clear that, you know, this is taxpayers' money. And we need to be sure, on the one hand, that it does not uh, get in the hands uh, of people with, uh, for their own interests, so which are not using the money in the right way, or uh, in countries or governments, regimes that are not complying with the fundamental rights and the values. If from the Netherlands, uh, there's a lot of criticism on the LGBTIQ uh, uh, legislation, meaning that uh, uh, LGBTIQ people cannot adopt children, that there even cannot be an information about uh, LGBTIQ people in schoolings or whatever. And what is Arba now doing is linking this, uh, the elections with a referendum on this issue. So we are very critical on that because we believe that, uh, uh, that, that people should have the right to live in the way that uh, they want to. And, and maybe if I may add, I think the propaganda, the, the fact that the media is completely in the hands of, of Orban is really uh, damaging for the public opinion as well. Because how do people know what's exactly going on if there's no free media? When I visited Hungary, I was very much impressed about there was one a group of people, volunteers, that were printing uh, 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 um, information about corruption and so on and, 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 and disseminated in villages in order to make sure that people have the possibility to read what's going on uh, in, in their country and what their regime is doing against them. Karolf, what's your reaction to what Tineke just said? Well, we, in our assessment as ID group, we think that if you try to find out why this anger, this uh, hatred against these two countries, Poland and Hungary, is so vivid, uh, that one of the main reasons in our uh, assessment is that uh, they were very firm on the migration issue. They closed borders. They closed the, the Balkan route.
they closed. They had the conflict with the Belarus last, uh, the po Poland at the Polish border, etc. These countries have a view that is comparable to what we want uh, the migration issue to be dealt with, uh, uh, and 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 this um, po popular, uh, these yeah, conservative and 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 um, uh, right wing governments are. Uh, against what this European Union wants. And the European Union, Union is attacking these governments, but also these people, for their view on migration. And so the migration issue plays a role without ever, ever being mentioned in debates like this. Uh, and again, I deplore that there, there is no Hungarian to defend the, the, the Hungarian case here around the table. Uh, I'll try to do what I can do, but I'm not representing the, the, the Hungarian government and I don't have all the, uh, the I have, don't, don't have the mandate to defend the government. But I think it's, uh, this European Union is not um, well, cannot be trusted with uh, these countries. Mika, short reaction. Uh, yes, it has absolutely nothing to do with migration. This is uh, precisely the propaganda that the Hungarian government in particular would want you to believe. Um, this, for instance, the conditionality regulation, the ability to, uh, to withdraw money from, uh, from the European, but uh, to, to suspend payments, has absolutely nothing to do with migration as a, and has everything to do with uh, having an independent judiciary, having an independent prosecution, having independent police that could possibly uh, and credibly investigate fraud uh, or embezzlement of European money. It has nothing to do with conservatism, nothing to do with migration. Uh, it has everything to do with protecting European, European money in this case, and more broadly, protecting the very basic principles that are inscribed in the treaty, such as rule of law, such as democracy, such as freedom of the media. Just to give an example, my government and my, my country, Slovakia, has been just as uh, adamant to, to, to oppose uh, migration back in 2015, uh, and yet there is uh, no rule of law infringement proceedings against my country. Uh, it has nothing to do with migration. That's, that's the propaganda. It has nothing to do with the fact that these governments are conservative. Uh, you know, there was lots of criticism against the Maltese government, uh, and it was a socialist government after the murder of journalist uh, Daphne Caruana Galizia. Uh, this is, I think, what, what we all need to understand, that there are some principles which are common to every member state, regardless of whether it's a socialist, liberal, conservative government, uh, and the European Union should be able to protect those. So we will go on exactly with migration. We mentioned already that Hungary has built a, a, a border fence on the border with Serbia, and that prompted a huge debate. And Caroline now has another interesting question to us. Indeed, our community is particularly concerned with the war in Ukraine um, and Hungary's response to it. Sean from Ireland has sent us this question. Hi, I'm Sean. I'm from Ireland. And my question is, um, in the context of the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, what promises can we see coming out of the Hungarian elections to provide aid, shelter and compassion for Ukrainian refugees entering Hungary? So, any reactions to this question? Well, so far, um, surprisingly, I guess, or what's good about um, not just Hungary, but the entire region of, of Central Eastern Europe, uh, Poland, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and, and Hungary has uh, has been welcoming to the uh, to the Ukrainian refugees um, in in terms of governments, but also in terms of civil society and, and ordinary citizens. There has been uh, quite a quite an amazing wave of solidarity and empathy towards towards those fleeing uh, fleeing war. I hope it can be sustained because this might be an issue that we're going to have to be dealing with not just today, but weeks and, and months from now. Um, uh, and this so far includes the Hungarian government and the Hungarian people. Uh, of course, uh, one difference is that uh, the, uh, the Hungarian government has so far refused any assistance, for instance, from Frontex or other European institutions in contrast to, uh, to, to Slovakia. Um, of course, now the question is uh, what kind of um, help and assistance uh, these frontline countries, member states, will get from, from the broader European, um, European Union. Um, and I hope that, uh, despite the fact that uh, you know, V4 countries were the most vocal uh, in opposing any solidarity back in 2015, uh, I, I, I really hope that uh, this time around um, um, they would come to understand why, why this is important. Gerolf, your reaction, please. Well, as you see, and I can confirm what my colleague said, there is a huge wave of solidarity 
towards Ukraine. Uh, and this is consistent with parties, national parties like mine and like Hungary and like Poland. Uh, we have always been saying that refugees should be taken in in their cultural environment as much as possible. So that's why we opposed migration, wild and unorganized migration from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Afghanistan. Uh, and that's why we are now all parties of ID group and also, uh, uh, as I know now, as I, 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 I see now, uh, Hung Hungary and Poland, they, they don't have to take lessons on migration as such. They go in the line that we have designed. We can host uh, refugees uh, from Europe in a European conflict. And uh, so this is perfectly in line. What happens now in Hungary and in Poland uh, is perfectly in line with what we all said on this. Tineke, is this a game changer in the migration debate and especially for Hungary? What is happening now in Ukraine? Well, it is a game changer in Hungary, for sure, because there was no asylum system anymore. No one could apply for asylum in Hungary, although it is a, we have an EU asylum system, so they were shifting all the responsibility to other countries. So it's good that this has changed, but it has changed specifically for this situation, I think. And I think we really need to look at uh, uh, who is doing what. What I hear from Hungary and also from Poland is that civil society is very active in providing a lot of humanitarian assistance. And also the municipalities are granting most of the, uh, of the assistance. And what we see is that, for instance, mayors, especially who are not from Fidesz uh, parties, have seen their budget decreased uh, uh, significantly during the recent years. They did not get any funding from the government anymore. So they are really, you know, uh, struggling with the lack of uh, funding. So this is why we also urge the European Commission to make sure that the funding that is really needed goes to the NGOs, to the organization and municipalities that are really offering this assistance because we, we cannot wait any longer. But maybe to make one final remark, I don't know if it's a game changer for the whole European asylum system, uh, because there we need to also to uh, have a responsibility for other refugees as well, from Afghanistan, for instance, and Syria, if they cannot be hosted in the region. And this problem will not be resolved by this uh, crisis that we see now in Ukraine. Andres, I would like to ask you, the government was campaigning against what they call illegal uh, migrants or economic migrants for years now, and now they are accepting hundreds of thousands of uh, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, how does it uh, go down in the campaign for the voters? I think that the major difference now compared to 2015 is the cultural background of the uh, of the refugees. So you can see it from the reaction both from the government and the Hungarian society that if the refugees are coming from uh, a similar cultural background, if they have no fear from the unknown, which was the case in uh, 2015, but now you know many of the uh, refugees are actually ethnic Hungarians living in Ukraine, and the other ones are the Ukrainians living together with hun Hungarians there. So uh, there, is, there is no uh, Islamophobia this time, of course. There is no uh, fear from the unknown, from different cultures. Uh, so now you can see much more solidarity than, uh, than six or seven uh, years ago. So this is why I would also doubt that this reaction would have a bigger uh, effect on the whole asylum-seeking policy of the Hungarian government and whether they would change their policies when it comes to Syrian or Afghan or, Afghan or uh, Iraqi refugees. Thanks very much for your contribution, uh, Andres. We will go on with uh, our three guests. But before we go on, we will move to Carolyn, who has a final question for us. Thank you. The war in Ukraine has had an enormous impact on Europe, and we've seen the EU take strong measures against Russia with unanimous support from state leaders. Among them, Viktor Orban, who is often a holdout on vote, like, votes against Russia. So, has the war changed opinions in Hungary as well? Let's hear a question from our Italian reader, Andrea, on this topic. Hello, everyone. My question is, in light of the recent happenings in Ukraine, 
how has the political dialogue in Hungary changed with regard to the European Union and in particular belonging to the European values? I would like to have a short reaction on this. Does the war in Ukraine mean that the EU and NATO membership for Hungary is more valuable now that we are members? I think Hungary will stay being a NATO uh, member anyhow. I think they are very well aware, as we all do, that this uh, NATO is more needed than ever. And especially now that we have to do with a dictator that uh, threatens us with nuclear weapons. Uh, and I think that Hungary, I'm quite sure that Hungary wants to stay a, Euro a European Union member, but not an, on the conditions of, this, of the actual mentality, the actual mindset of uh, the, uh, the EU uh, majority here in the parliament. I think they want to change this uh, European Union in reducing the powers of the federal and centralized, and especially the commission, and uh, making a... a, 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 a a new era, a renaissance, so to say, for the member states and the, the, the concept of a, of a cooperation on European level, yes, but not a, a, an imposing federal state, imposing a social model on the states with a, a court of justice that rejects any claim of the member states, etc. No, we need another European Union. And I think uh, Hungary, I'm sure Hungary will be a loyal partner in, in changing this. Mikhail, what's your opinion? Of course, not just for Hungary, but also for, for my country, for Slovakia, the, um, you know, the Russian invasion, Russian aggression, you know, drives home the point of how crucial our membership in the European Union and in NATO is. Um, but for Viktor Orban, he, you know, wants to have his cake and, and eat it too. He wants the European Union because of, of the money it provides for, for his oligarchs and, of course, for the protection that uh, NATO membership provides. But he would continue to, if he's, if he's re-elected, continue to torpedo uh, European Union efforts, you know, to contain Putin's aggression, for instance, by speaking out against, uh, against further sanctions, by refusing to, uh, to, to provide assistance um, to Ukraine. Uh, and I really hope that the Hungarian um, voters will recognize that for, for, for what it is. I mean, he, uh, as, as, we, as we heard, Viktor Orban now has this narrative that, uh, you know, this is not our war, this is not the war of, of Hungarians and we shouldn't be taking sides and we should be... Mm you know, striving for peace. You know, this is, a, this is a fallacy. Of course, it is partly our war because it's war that, uh, that Vladimir Putin is waging uh, on Ukraine, but on Europe as well. Uh, and, and I think, you know, if Viktor Orban misleads uh, the public for the sake of, you know, getting, getting votes, uh, I, I, my, my fear is that should he be elected, this would weaken the European Union response to, to Vladimir Putin uh, and to Russia's aggressive policy toward, toward Ukraine and Europe. Tineke, you have the floor for a yeah. short answer. Uh, about the invasion of Russia, of, uh, by Russia to Ukraine, von der Leyen said very clearly, this is a clash between autocrats and democracy, with our EU values. And what we've seen in the recent years is that Orban is always flirting with the autocrats. It is Putin, Erdogan, Trump. And I hope that for the Hungarian citizens, it has become clear that uh, they should, uh, that the side of the democracy and the values is in their own interest. What I see also regarding bribery and corruption is Orban is very much serving his own interest. And what we just heard Fides voters uh, 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 choose for the, the, the societal problems like income and so on, I think they're very much interlinked. If you choose Orban, who is serving his own interest, where the money goes, uh, where, where, where his uh, 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 family is, is becoming more richer, then uh, the, the interests of society are not served. And I think, I really hope, we will go into the direction of democracy, rule of law, and the real interest of the citizens. Just for a final question, according to you, who's going to win, Viktor Orban or Peter Markizai? Mikhail, in one word. I don't know, but I, but I hope for Europe and for Central Europe that uh, Viktor Orban will not be re-elected. Kerolf. I hope he wins. And I'm sure he will. Tineke. I hope he will not be able to continue this uh, rule of law uh, backsliding. 
So that's it for our discussion on the Hungarian elections. Of course, we will be keeping a close eye on the developments here at Euronews. I would like to thank our guests, Tina Kastirk, Mikhail Simecka and Herolf Anemans. Also a big thank to our expert from Hungary, András Bíronagy, as well as Caroline Will at the Debating Europe team. That's it from here in the European Parliament. A big thanks to them too. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye. Thank you.